forth and make songs out of it or whatever it is. <laughs> and so, fine. Now the social layer has something to do. It has some social act that they can participate in here in the game. But you might look somewhere else on the table and the one guy who was participating in the battle is kind of, you know, get on with a kind of feeling to it. He may well be a thinking player because now he's stopped here to talk to this dying guy. And you know what, I really don't know this dying guy and he's not saying much of interest seriously. <laughs> Nothing that pertains to the objective of the adventure. And so, of course, the dying guy now has to <laughs> drop off. I know the secret way in. Oh, hey, okay, secret way. You got to <laughs> you know, it's a flying emphasis, and, that, and that's important because it keeps all of the players involved. <coughs> now, as an XDM, one of the things that you have to understand is that you are not here to beat the players. Huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> not that way. <laughs> you, you aren't here to win this game. Because, of course, it's a game that can't really be won. You are called a referee for a reason. Okay? And that is because your job is to adjudicate the game, not beat the players. As the game. You want to beat players as the game. Play Monopoly. Play risk. Play something where you're on even, where you're on even ground, and and and, and it is a game designed for that. Your job here is to be a director, to be an, an actor, to be set construction, to provide experience for what the players receive in the game. If you really feel like it's you against the players, you need to stop being a DM. If you have a DM who believes that it's him versus you, he needs to be a player. Because the objective here is not winning the game part. The objective here is to have experience that is bigger than the game. So, knowing what these are will help a lot. How then, I mean, if we're dealing with an entire party of warrior players, yes, you put them fight stuff. If you're dealing with an entire party of social players, yes, you put them in the tavern, let them talk. If you're dealing with thinking players, you mix it up and you provide puzzles and traps that are apparent obstacles to them they have to overcome and goodness, and see progress. Um, if, if that is, um, the question is now, what do you do when you have a, you know what, I didn't give you the third player type, did I? No, no, no. <laughs> what if you have a specialist? What if you have, what if you have a specialist? What if you have um, a game, uh, a, an engineer in your, in your group? Or what if you have the third type, or the sixth type in all of this, the spoiler? Yeah, you've had it in your group, haven't you? He is the person in the group who just wants to screw it up for everybody else. I think I hear an amen over here. Uh, yes. And that's in a specific player type. I was talking with uh, Richard Garrett, who, who did all the Ultima games and, and, and does uh, computer... Uh, fantasy game, an online game, and um, I was talking to Richard, and he was saying that in their game design, they have to literally account for the type of player, especially in MMOs, they have to literally account for the type of player who just wants to come in and screw it up. Yeah. These are, the, and you have to provide them, bizarrely, it seems to me anyway, the ability to do that so they will keep paying you money to screw up your game. <laughs> I repeat, eh? <laughs> well, I guess that works for MMOs because that's, I guess that's their economic model. Let's give them a toy that they can break so that they can buy a new toy so they can break it and buy a new toy. Maybe that's their style, but it's not mine. 
What do you do about these last three player types? We talked about the first two. But what do we do about the last? One? What do we do first about about the engineer player? Any thoughts? Yeah. I think uh, uh, oh, engineers. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I have something for specialists. Well, go with specialists. Let's see what you have to say so about that. Specialists. I, I have to do with specialists. You can design a character around the range, always staying out of range of the enemy while being able to dish damage to the enemy, and always having the ability to escape at the last at, at the last second if somebody hit him. Um, so for a while there, I encourage this. So go ahead. You're designing your character with a very specific strategy in mind. I encourage that. Because if it wasn't any skin off the high feet, but let it play with it. Right. But every once in a while, I would throw in a creature and we had to close with it and give them an option to escape. So every once in a while, you know, you just put the fear of God in them. But for the most part, I just kind of encourage that because that's what they want to play. They want to play a character who can give build their strategy and play that strategy. But every once in a while, you have to get in their face or something. Mix it up once in a while. And he was happy, and he ended up making the game over rules. But uh, ultimately, like, while he was able to do that, he was comfortable, he was having fun. Um, so that's basically just once in a while, like, I threw something in his face, and that would, you know, that would get him to kind of have to react. And then he would be like, okay, now I have something else I have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So then that allowed him to continue to nurture his specialist style of gameplay while at the same time satisfying his, his desire to play a style. Exactly. And I think, you've, I think you've hit on something really key here. And this is what he wanted to do. This is who he wanted to be. He wanted to be the guy in the back who was, and he felt comfortable with that, and he felt like that was good strategy for him. But what you then, and, and you allowed him to do that, which I think is exactly what you should do. And then what you do is, of course, you have people occasionally sneak up behind you. And because that is a problem for someone who stands in the back. You know, the whole idea that we deal with like frontal army here, and, and these are the guys in the front, and then we have the guys in the back of the and then we have the arrows behind that. <coughs> Only works as long as there's nobody behind you. And that's exactly what works for this guy, and I think that's a great approach. Yes, go ahead and, if they want to be a specialist, go ahead and let them be a specialist, but I think it's incumbent upon you as an XDM to find out where the Achilles heel is in that, and to occasionally use it. But, so I have a question. Sure. Which sounds good in a situation where you combat, but I had a specialist player who literally did not engage the rest of the player group unless you were in his specialty. So how does playing to a specialty in those situations still encourage you to engage with the rest of the game? Because my group got frustrated because you can sit there like, well, I'm literally doing other stuff for four hours of the gaming session. And then, you know, that one hour or two hour period of combat, you engage and move around and everything else, mm -hmm. and then he would fly again. Yes. Well, I typically would encounter that problem myself uh, with a social player, actually, who would just tune out whenever I was in combat. So what I would typically do is I would try to weave their specialty into the other things that I needed them to pay attention to. Uh, such that, for example, uh, there was a, an attack during, a, uh, during a, a council meeting of some kind, but the council meeting needed to continue, so we had this, char this social character who was trying to deal with the council meeting issue while still engaging in combat and still talking to, having to talk to the other players to coordinate how they were interacting with the council. That got them into that, and since, I don't know, with, when I deal with players like that, I find that once you wake them up enough in the meeting, they'll tune in at least for the rest of that night, and then it's a matter of making what you run into later that's a great point. In fact, call their attention back to their stuff. You may be, I'm sitting here thinking, uh, reflecting on what you were saying, actually, about your character, about your player here. I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if you found that one thing that you really wanted that would really make his his character solid? You know, that that one MacGuffin. Do you know what a MacGuffin is? <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, a MacGuffin is that thing in the story that everybody wants. If you found his MacGuffin, for example, he had that that one that one thing that would really make what he loves to do fabulous, and then create an adventure for that that required essentially the, the structure of it required that he interact with people, the rest of the party along the way, if he was ever going to achieve that. 
and this is a great and utilize the ability of other people in the group in order to get there, it's a great teaching opportunity. And, and, we'll, and I believe, as you were saying, we'll bring them out of that, that special place. Yes? What do you do when you have a specialist who their focus... Sorry, I just, no, 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 I'm really taken by the news. Well, okay, I have a buddy who's been gaming for quite a while, and his wife wants to game with us. Because she's a specialist in that way that when her eccentric characters, who are always bizarrely... She, like a halfling barbarian who insisted she was a ten-year-old girl to okay. everyone, even while carrying full plate and a giant clip, like, goes past odd to delusional. Okay. And she would completely ignore most of the story to the point where she wouldn't even level her character. We had to make her do it or do it for her. And the only time she got animated was when she was trying to convince some new person that the reason she has a tiger head hanging off her belt is because daddy gave her a new dog or something like that. Because she doesn't want to admit she's a barbarian. Huh. But the rest of the time she's on her phone playing Fruit Ninja or something. <laughs> and like, we, we, you know, we pretty much tried everything, like even to the point of sort of making sessions around her bizarre uh -huh. fixation, like another halfling trying to court her, which involved bacon beds and stuff. Just got very strange. But like, we have, for years, not been able to figure out how to get this girl wow. to actually play. Wow. As that opposed to just sort of hover over her husband and be insane. <laughs> <laughs> Through character. I'm not saying she's insane. Just... Well, I'm not so sure. <laughs> 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 okay, you have anybody <laughs> it, You know, that's very interesting because one of the things about, one of the things about role playing is that it allows us an avenue to express things in our lives. Um, and, and actually, as I'm, like, as, I'm, as I'm thinking about, I, I don't know this person, of course, and, and, you know, and, my, and frankly, I charge an enormous amount for therapy, but <laughs> <laughs> for game therapy, don't think that people haven't called me for advice. You know, I like the Dr. Phil of games. And, but, but what I would say, it just in from what you told me, is that this is not as much a specialist problem as it is a spoiler problem. Because it sounds to me that she's getting something out of this behavior that is satisfying something in her. Wow, has this gotten way deep or what? <laughs> And which actually leads us to a certain extent to a spoiler player. Because a spoiler player messes the game up. And this, see, when, when you're talking, when you're listening, I'm hearing messing up the game. And when I hear messing up the game, I'm thinking spoiler player. A spoiler player, in this case, means that they, that they get attention or some satisfaction out of messing up the game. So how do we deal with a spoiler player? How do we deal with someone who intentionally wants to screw up the party, screw up the game, uh, and, 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 and mess the balance up among the people who are playing the game? Yeah. yeah. Again, you can't throw that ball in certain social situations as possible. You try and move the whatever it is that they're getting satisfaction from. So if you are paying attention to them because this, whatever you're doing, then you stop, you stop, stop rewarding them. Yeah. yeah. I make so, it backfire on them. I'm sorry? I make it backfire on them. Make it backfire on them, yes. Yes. If they're only there to spoil the game, then they, they've got to go. Well, it is certainly true that to a certain extent, I think that this is one of those times when one should consider the Jack Bauer rule. Oh, I'm sorry, most of you don't know the Jack Bauer rule. <laughs> There's an actual slide for the Jack Bauer rule, but I will go ahead and tell you about the Jack Bauer rule because of time. Jack Bauer rule. When Jack Bauer finds a terrorist, he doesn't talk to them. He doesn't search his own feelings about the subject. Um, he doesn't consult with other people about what to do. What does Jack Bauer do when he sees a terrorist? 
Take out the brass. And he kills them with a very large gun. And sometimes twice. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and, and, and so sometimes the death power will actually is lethal. Sometimes you just need to kill a character. Yes.
Sweet. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> actually, there is actually a rule in the original ABV book, probably now lost to us in Arcana, but the, in the ABV book, there was a rule that Gary put in that said, regardless of anything else that is. A lot of money. Yeah, we could just do the thing. Which is, of course, why we have the XP20 system, which is so basic in terms of its resolution. I'd like to address that just for a second, if, if I might. Um, in, in terms of, well, first of all, again, in terms of specific players, you want to look them and bring them out. In terms of engineer players, you want to engineer things for them, as you were saying that will expand that for them, that is outside the rule set so that they have something to explore. And in terms of the spoiler player, you need to determine what it is they are getting out of spoiling your game and deny it. Deny them. I know my spoiler player accounted for it is actually. He's like a healer without poverty and I mean it just it was ridiculous all the and I just Held him accountable. Whenever he wanted to stand there where the fighter couldn't do this and drive everybody out because of his vow of peace and he couldn't do this, he couldn't do that. I'm like, okay, but why, are, why do you have this vow? It's an empty vow if you're really not practicing anything else. When's the last time you spent any time with your deity? When's the last time you did anything else? And so in game, we started right. playing on that. One of the things that we talked about all one of the things we talk about all the time in, in our NXTM is accountability. You have to have, there has to be rules to your world and you have to follow them. Because just to not follow them for, uh, out of expedience it cheats your players and makes you feel bad. Again, that's, that is in the book. What I did want to talk about just for very, oh, golly, very quickly is that um, the First of all, I've taken a look at D&D Next. D&D Next system basically boils down to you have statistics. The referee of the game will assign a difficulty level to that accomplishment, and then you will roll against the difficulty that the DM assigns. That is exactly what we do in the XD20 system. <gasps> We were pioneers and we didn't know that. <laughs> of course, we're copyrighted pioneers, but that's a different thing. <laughs> I just think it's interesting that the ND Next system is moving, is now slowly moving in the direction that we've already established in our game system, which is play. The play is the thing. The other, second thing I want to say to you is again, and we do have to wrap up really quickly is that we are going to be working over the next year on the XPC book. Because there's been so many wonderful discussions that we've had on forums on, the, on, our, on our website, and so many incredible contributions on the website. We want you to first know, we want, we're going to be opening up the website for submissions. If you have a section that you think should be in the XPC book, and you'd like to submit it for consideration, we're going to do that through the website. We're going to group source the, uh, the XPC book because so many of you have such great ideas. And you know, and for that, you know, we're going to send you a copy of the book, your name's going to be in the book, and whatever it is we need to do. But we want you to join us in creating this book. Because what we've discovered out of SDM is that there are so many of you out there with such great ideas of how to improve games that we want to share that with everybody. So, those of you who are here, you have taken the test, you are now initiated into XDM, you have to do the official XDM sign, right? Yes. Okay, that just goes like this, to X, D, M, two. And this is very important to do this, okay? All right, everybody stand up, here we go, ready? Okay. All right.